New series starting on the book of Psalms. Good morning, guys. Good to see, ev- good to, good to see everybody who blew in this morning with, with the wind, and good to be seen by those of you who are joining us online, um, especially if you're part of the church family. Maybe you're not feeling so well. A lot of people got sick last week. I know my, my wife is uh, not feeling too well today. So if you're uh, joining us, we miss you. We want to see you back with us real soon. If you are checking us out, maybe looking for a church in the area, maybe you're looking to le- learn more about the Lord Jesus, we'd love to have you here with, with us at the Steeple Center. So come and see us real soon. So as Bruce said, new mini-series on the book of Psalms, which is one of the most well-known books in all the Bible. A lot of folks know quotes from the book of Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And while it's not the longest book in the Bible, if we're counting by words, it is the longest book if we're counting by chapters and verses. 150 Psalms, 150 chapters, longest by far. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter by verses in the whole Bible. 176 verses, over 2,400 words. So I hope you all had a big breakfast this morning. No, I'm just kidding. Although the Vikings aren't playing today, we could pull it off. Okay, so Psalms. It is a book of poems. Most people not interested in poetry. In fairness, there is a lot of uninteresting poetry. And one of the nice things about a poem, if you're forced to read one for homework, is that they're usually short and self-contained. And the biblical psalms are also self-contained. We can read an individual psalm start to finish as part of a daily devotion. We'll get something out of it. We can track with that. Yet, if we were to only read the psalms as self-contained little poems, we'd be really be missing out. In a class that he taught on belief in God, one public intellectual said, that the Bible is perhaps the world's first hyperlinked text. And then he pointed to this image. This infographic shows all the cross-references or hyperlinks in the Bible. The lines along the bottom each represent a chapter of the Bible according to the length measured in verses. So you can see that longest line there close to the middle is Psalm 119. It's got the most verses. And those overlapping, colorful lines arcing across the top each represent a cross-reference in the Bible, all the parts of the Bible that refer to each other. The author of the graphic says 63,779 cross-references, all bending in colorful lines. I figure we could study this graphic alone just for days, follow each line. I have no doubt we would learn a lot just by doing that. If we were to jump into the book of Exodus or one of the Gospels in the middle, it'd kind of be like jumping into the middle of a movie. I'm a little confused, missing some context. Maybe we can go back to the start so I can get that context. This is less the case with individual psalms because they're self-contained poems. They are. But they are not only self-contained. The poetry across the Bible and in the book of Psalms is full to the brim of references to the rest of Scripture, whether looking back to creation, looking back to Israel's exodus from Egypt, looking left and right to the other wisdom literature, or looking forward to the promised Savior, Jesus. That is obvious, looking at something like this. It's one piece of the hyperlink puzzle. Another piece is that the Psalms, though many are self-contained poems referencing other stuff, are themselves arranged in a particular order. They're put that way on purpose. They're not randomly selected. They're, they're not arranged by length. They are not billboard top 150 psalms. They've got an order on purpose. So we should expect that our actual text for today, Psalm 1, wouldn't be the first psalm for no good reason. It is Psalm 1 for a reason. It is placed first on purpose like a welcome mat or a guidepost or an open door to orient us to everything that comes after it. Psalm 1 has independent points it's making. Psalm 1 also orients us to the whole book of Psalms. How does it do that? Well, let's look at it together. 
So if you haven't gotten there yet, find some Psalm 1 in your Bible or Bible app. Psalm 1, verse 1. While you're finding Psalm 1, I'll remind you how important it is to daily be exposed to the Word of God. He's preserved these scriptures for us over the millennia, and he's used these words to teach billions and billions of people. What a privilege that we have such easy access to it. All of us should be making regular space in our schedules to delight in and meditate on these words. Don't neglect this foundational practice. Okay, Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man or person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Let's pray. Holy Father, you are good, and we praise you. Thank you for the privilege we have of seeing and hearing your words preserved for us down through history. We ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, open our eyes and our ears to you. We know that this is one of the ways you change us for our own and the world's good. Help us delight in and meditate on your words as we turn to them today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed is a word easy to misunderstand in English. Sounds extra religious, a little esoteric, a good way to understand the Hebrew. Here would be something like, happy is the person who, good on the person who, you're doing the right thing by. Blessed is the man. It says man, it means person. Blessed is the person. Blessed is anybody who. Charles Spurgeon said this about it. It is not blessed is the king. Blessed is the scholar. Blessed is the rich. But blessed is the man. This blessedness is attainable by the poor. Blessed is the forgotten and the obscure. It comes to any man or woman who loves God and seeks to obey him. The good life is obtainable by anybody and everybody because God loves everybody. He wants everybody to be blessed. That's why he sent Jesus. And let's not forget how much time Jesus spent with common folks and outsiders. Regardless of where you sit today, this wisdom is for you. So what is it blessed to do? It is blessed not to walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. What we have here is something you see a lot in the Psalms and other Old Testament poetry. There's a narrowing down of the language. In English, we often use rhymes to show that something is a poem. In Hebrew, one way to show that something is a poem is by saying the same thing over and over using synonyms, one after the other in repeating patterns. Like in Psalm 19, for example, it says this, the decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honey comb. So you see that's another example of that principle. Synonyms are used and the, now, and the focus narrows in. If you keep this in mind while reading the Old Testament, you'll realize it's always been there right under your nose. So how about Psalm 1? Let's look back at it. The words intensify from walking to standing to sitting, from counsel to way to seat, from wicked to sinners to scoffers. The psalmist is outlining a trajectory a person follows if they're not blessed, because blessed is the one who doesn't do this stuff. Well, what don't they do? The unblessed trajectory begins by walking in the counsel of the wicked. That means listening to the wicked and doing what they advise. The Hebrew here for wicked means a person who is morally backward. They've got things flipped around. They could be an intelligent person, but they say bad is good and good is bad. There has never been a shortage of people who use their intelligence or skill to do morally backward things. So that unblessed trajectory begins by walking with those who are wicked. There's a big difference between recognizing someone's right to speak and taking every bad idea to heart. Plenty of dumb stuff getting said 24-7. If you want to, you can get on TikTok and do nothing but listen to dumb stuff 24-7. There are Christians who it seems their whole ministry is correcting dumb stuff said by the wicked. 
on social media because unfortunately, there are a lot of impressionable people walking in the wicked's counsel. Just because somebody has the right to speak doesn't mean you are obligated to listen. Not only are you not obligated to listen, you shouldn't. Jesus was with morally backward people all the time, but he was on a mission. He invested in people on purpose. Jesus was with the wicked, but they were in his counsel. And that is how many of them became blessed. So if your posture toward the morally backward isn't to be a counselor, if you're the one being morally confused instead of bringing moral clarity, you need to take a long, hard look at what you're doing and who you're doing it with. Whether you realize it or not, you are being pointed in a direction. So then the language gets stronger. If you're walking in wicked counsel, soon you'll be standing in the way of sinners who are sinners. If you've been in church a while, you may have heard that the word sin means to miss the mark. That's sort of true. There's a whole lot of words in the Bible translated sin or to sin, and most of them don't actually mean miss the mark. But this one does. You're walking in the way of people who are always off the mark. You're not just putzing around with those who are morally backward. Now you're standing around in the path of those who are off target in doing God's will. Jesus tells us in Matthew 22 that God's will boils down to loving God and loving our neighbor as ourselves. So they're not doing that in the strictest terms, which makes complete sense. If this is a trajectory being described, how are people who are morally backward, if they're going the backward way, going to do better? They're going to do worse, not better. You're, you're morally backward. Of course, you're going to miss the mark. If the target's this way, you're going this way and shooting that way. That's why the word repent means to turn direction. And then we descend to the lowest tier. We are just walking around with the backward counsel. Then we're standing around with those missing the mark. And now we're sitting around with scoffers or mockers. If you're walking with someone, it's not so hard to walk away. If you're standing around with them, a little harder to walk away, but you can. If you're sitting around with them, that means you're friends. And who are these scoffers or mockers? It's worse than the first two. If someone's morally backward, maybe they can be corrected. If someone's missing the mark, maybe they can start shooting in the right direction. But if someone is a mocker, this is a person who has made it their business to talk smack. Particularly, they're smack-talking God's authority to define good and evil. They're smack-talking God's word and God's people and insist that they have the authority to sit in judgment as scoffers. They're content sitting in that place that makes them feel like they are in charge. How many of you know that we are living in the age of scoffers? Psalm 1 is highlighting a growing comfortability with going the wrong way and then living in that wrong way. From people who are confused in doing the wrong thing to those who are actively hostile and believe that they have the authority to mock God's authority. Blessed is the person who is not on the path that will turn them into a mocker. It should make us ask, which way are we going? If there's a downward spiral of going the wrong way, that implies an upward spiral, a better way of the blessed. So look at verse 2. The blessed person's delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So what's the essential difference between the two roads? Is it just, well, I got to work harder. I got to be more disciplined to keep marching the path. Sometimes spiritual discipline, it does look like work, but it's a difficult balancing act. Historically, churches like ours haven't done a good job at this balancing act. We're great at telling people, hey, you've got to have an encounter with the living God. You need to confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. You need to be born again and then come to church so we can all live it together and learn what that looks like. A lot of folks get five years in and they're like, yes, I believe that. I, I don't miss Sunday. I give money to support the ministry. I serve. I'm in a city group. I'm in the Bible study. And it all feels like dry routine. Many Bible-believing churches have focused on starting the faith journey, and we do need that. 
but we've done not such a great job at helping each other cultivate our affections for God. It sounds too emotional. It's it's too happy-clappy. We want the truth, and truth doesn't care about feelings. The psalmist says, blessed is the person who delights in, delights in, and meditates on the law of the Lord. What is delight? I'm sorry to say, Strong's Concordance is not going to rescue you here. It means what you think it means, to take pleasure in, to desire, to enjoy. It's about nourishment. It's about what you love most. One theologian said, you are what you love. It's an important foundational idea in this very first psalm that we see repeated across the book of Psalms, like in Psalm 42. As a deer pants for the flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Psalm 63, O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Clearly it's important. So how can we practice it? Three quick takeaways on delight. We shepherd delight through musical worship. It's why many of the psalms are set to music. It's why the early Christians sang hymns and spiritual songs, why the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians 3, for example, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Or in Ephesians 5, he says this, And don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or that famous passage about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, for example, it's beautiful teaching about how Jesus is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, Many scholars believe that that passage is Paul straight up quoting an early Christian hymn, just putting it right there in his letter. And in a lot of Bible uh, translations, Philippians 2, they format it like a psalm to help get that across. We shepherd delights and teach truth through musical worship. It can be tempting to show up close to the sermon start and leave close to the sermon end. Do not deny yourself the biblically sanctioned source of delight in God that is musical worship. Next, we shepherd delight by identifying, confessing, and repenting of sin. Even if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, sin can still hinder. The devil and his angels cannot steal us from God. Amen? So instead, what they want to do is incite our temptation to sin so that we feel like we don't know him. Sin hinders our ability to delight in Jesus and what he's done and his words to us because it plagues us with shame that we shouldn't be carrying. He took care of that for us. That's why the Bible repeatedly tells us to repent, to turn away from the wrong direction, why we're told to confess our sins to God and one another and to boldly approach Jesus' throne of grace. One of the things Jesus did for us when he sacrificed himself for us was provide a way to unload our shame rent-free. So if you're not able to delight in God and his teaching and in what Jesus said, consider, when's the last time you did a real heart check? Is there sin that needs to be identified, confessed to God, confessed perhaps even to a trusted brother or sister in Christ and to repent of? It may be hindering your delight, Third, we shepherd delight by leaning on each other. We've talked about it so much this year. The church is like a body with many different body parts. The church is the family of God. Have you ever met another Christian? And man, they just encourage you. You see how they live and you think, I I need more of that person in my life. Whatever that person's got, I need that. It's contagious in the best way. I've got a couple of friends like that. Every time I'm with them, I'm inspired to seek the Lord more. Their presence, their witness, their faith, it shepherds my delight in the Lord. So 
Find people like that in your life who encourage you and let them know that, that they are encouragement to you and that it's good to have them around. And, you know, get their contact on your home screen, on your phone. Let them know from time to time. Get in touch with them. So there's delight and the three ways of shepherding it. And then there is meditation. What is meditation? It is not sitting on the mountaintop waiting for enlightenment. Biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is when we return to God's words over and over, sometimes very slowly. And when those words get into our hearts, we see them differently, and we can apply them differently to different circumstances over time in life. If we were to use a metaphor, think of a big diamond with all these facets in it, and when you hold it up to the light and turn this diamond, there are so many ways that the diamond bends the light, and you know, you could come up close to it or you could pull it back a little bit more and that'll influence how the diamond shines in your eyes. Reading the Bible is not like reading the grapes of wrath for homework. It's not a one and done. It's not a, you don't, you don't mark that done on Goodreads. Meditating on God's teachings is like looking at a diamond from different angles over time. That's what meditating on the Bible means recitation, repetition, focusing, paying attention, asking questions, seeking insight from other believers, asking for God's help in all of it. I can't tell you how many times I've read something in Scripture, 50 times, and then I get to the 51st time, and it's like, bam, whoa, how did I never notice that before? This is really important. Or I'll see something that I do remember, that I'm going through something tough, at the time. I need a specific kind of wisdom, and I never realized how significant this verse was or this chapter or book until my situation changed. There's a cyclical relationship between delight and meditation. You're not going to meditate on something you don't delight in, and as you meditate on it, you will delight on it more and more. It'll refresh your delight. It'll drive your continued meditation, and on and on and on. That's what that means. The path of the blessed person is marked by delighting in and meditating on what God has taught. God is calling us to a trajectory. It's a way of living based on the correct origin point. What you love determines where you are going. In the New Testament, it's revealed to us that delighting in the instruction of the Lord starts with believing that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, that he really lived, really died, and really lives now. The kind of person who loves what God has said becomes the kind of person who does justice and righteousness, as the Old Testament repeatedly tells us, and Jesus reaffirmed that and intensified it in his teachings. Jesus said that you'll know someone by their fruit. If a tree's roots are underground, you can't see them. Maybe that tree's dying. To know if the tree is really healthy, look at the fruit. The Apostle James tells us faith without works is dead. The Bible's consistent answer to the question of how to love God and live well is not just work harder, just beat yourself up all the time because you aren't good enough. The Bible's consistent answer to the question of how to live well is examine what you love most. Do you love God most? Love God most, everything else will fall into place. The essential difference between the path of the righteous and the path of the wicked is that they differ in what they love most. The difference is not one works harder, one smarter, all the stuff that we look at, and if we're not careful, we'll conflate earthly blessing with God's blessing. There are plenty of people who are tremendously successful in the world's eyes. They're being driven by the complete wrong things. They are called scoffers. The psalmist then shifts the metaphor into plants, a tree growing and chaff blowing. Look here at verse 3. He, the, that is the blessed one, is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The blessed are like trees planted near streams. The wicked are like chaff that's blown away in the wind. This is a strong distinction. The, the blessed is like a thriving tree, constant nourishment from nearby fresh water source, 
we might say it is delighting in and meditating on living water, and the fruits are growing in the right season. The wicked, by contrast, are like the leftover parts of grain that gets thrown away or fed to the goats or ground up and thrown in the dirt. This ain't saying that the blessed is like a strong tree, the wicked is like a weak tree. It's, it's healthy tree versus leftover goat food. That's a big difference. If it is not painfully obvious already to all of you, my parents are from New York City. Could you tell? I know some of y'all's parents are from the farm. And some of y'all are from the farm. And some of y'all still on the farm. Okay? So I'm sure that there are niche exceptions to this. My understanding generally is that grain has to be replanted every year. That about right? Okay. I'm getting a nod from the farmer. The life cycle is less than one year of grain. Even a short-lived tree lives like 25 years. A lot of trees live 100 years. Long-lived trees, they live like 5,000 years. A tree takes a long time to mature. Grain takes a few months, short-term success. God is drawing us toward eternal life. What a difference the psalmist draws for us. Grain sprouts quickly, then it's gone. The wicked are like the leftovers of the grain. The blessed person is like that long-lasting tree, takes a while to reach maturity. The fruit comes in its season at the right time. Sometimes it isn't fruit season. You've got to wait. Yet in all they do, the blessed prosper which is an interesting statement in all they do. If the blessed person delights in the law of the Lord and meditates, it on, meditates on it day and night, this limits what all means. Clearly, the psalmist does not include armed robbery under the umbrella of all here. Okay? You, you don't get to ask God, Lord Jesus, be with me in my armed robbery today. Okay, that's not how that works. You are not the blessed person if that's what you think by that. You're wicked. It doesn't apply to you. We talked about this recently, actually, in our young adult group on Thursday nights. And if you know someone who's about college age, upper teens, lower 20s, looking for a group to meet, we do that on Thursdays. Uh, come talk to me. Talk to Garrett or Charlie. We'd love to have you with us. But we just finished the book of James. And one of the things James, the brother of Jesus, writes in his letter is this in James 4.2. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You don't have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. James is telling Christians, you don't receive from God because you don't seek him, so you don't really believe he's going to give it to you. And those who do bother to seek him, you're asking for your greeds, not your needs. The psalmist, the apostles, the Lord himself are not promising us that by being religious or being on the path of the blessed, we are going to achieve necessarily wealth, health, and happiness as it is defined by our society. That is not necessarily what prospering in God's blessed way looks like. Verse 5, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We are shown two roads, two ways, the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous. Remember the wicked were walking away. Sinners were standing around in that way, and scoffers were sitting around in judgment seats. But then it says here that the wicked will be unable to stand in the judgment. One path leads to true eternal flourishing, the other to ruin. So often, though, we look at the wicked and the scoffers. And you know what? They don't seem to be doing very bad, do they? You got dictators walking around in Louis Vuitton, riding in the Rolls Royce. The people are starving. You got lion deceiving punk at work. It's up for promotion for some reason. Richard Dawkins wrote The God Delusion. It's a New York Times bestseller. He's been called the world's most famous atheist. He made a public career out of scoffing at God. Net worth, $10 million. Even Tony Soprano sent his kids to private school. If you're looking at God's created world as part of it, 
as we all are, if you're viewing life from inside the system as we all are, then we see often that wicked sinning scoffers, they seem to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. They're taking advantage of others, mocking God's concern for justice and righteousness. Right now, many of our countrymen are suffering across the Southeast. I have an aunt who lives in Asheville, North Carolina. She's been following Jesus for 40 years. Now she can't go home. There are no roads to get her home. I have other family in Florida who are okay with God, but they're not really following Jesus. They didn't even lose power. So the faithful Christian is homeless. The folks who like God around Christmas and Easter didn't even lose Netflix. There are a lot of people who have unfortunately been led to believe that God's blessed way means life will be all rainbows and butterflies. But God never promised that. Jesus said that we will have trouble in this world, and being more or less religious or faithful does not change that. The prophet Elijah spoke God's truth, and he was hunted, and he was homeless in the wilderness. And Jeremiah, the prophet, spoke God's truth. He was thrown into a well by people who didn't want to hear what God had to say. Job lost everything and was chastised by his friends. They reasoned that God is refereeing a tit-for-tat moral system, and therefore Job had to have done something worth punishing. But God said Job did nothing wrong. It wasn't punishment. It makes us ask, is walking the blessed way really worth it? We need to know that it is ultimately true that blessed is the person who doesn't walk in the wicked's counsel. You and I might be blessed by Psalm 1 standards and not doing so hot. We can so often be tempted to think that if we're faithful, if we're good people, if we do the right thing, then everything's going to turn out how we expect, what we think life should look like. Worship team, you guys can make your way up if you'd like. Maybe you've seen this before. Sometimes going the right way doesn't feel good. Sometimes it looks dumb to scoffers. Sometimes you're down here in this ravine, and it looks like the scoffers are up there on top, and they're looking down on you. Ha ha, if God really loved you, why are you down there and I'm up here? There's a big difference between everything turning out good ultimately and everything going the way you want it to or the way others think it should go for you. Even in Christ, life is very often not that smooth, straight path. Like that top picture, it's often more like doing a tough mutter on that bottom picture. <clears throat> Psalm 1 encourages us, encourages us with the fundamental truth that the Lord knows the way of the righteous, even if it's a tough mutter. The wicked will be held accountable. You and I might not witness it. God's promise is this. He will not make everything easy, but you will be like a deeply rooted tree. You will get rained on. You will get blown by the wind. But unlike chaff, you will not get blown away. That's a really important orienting idea. If you are about to read 149 more psalms that are about all sorts of topics, by all sorts of authors experiencing the whole spectrum of human emotion, some of the Psalms are pretty raw. They say stuff that you and I would never say in church. The psalmists themselves are not often doing so hot. Maybe some of us aren't doing so hot right now. You are blessed. You are blessed if you pursue the wisdom to love what is ultimate because this correctly orients us in God's world. It doesn't matter if you're on the hilltop or stuck in the valley, you are a planted tree. You are flourishing. You are a source of life to others. You are going the right way. You are blessed. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your goodness and your love to us. We ask you to encourage us along your better way. Help us delight in you and your teachings. Help us delight through music, through fellowship, to unload our shame through confession and repentance. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to meditate on your word as we go deep into it 
and it goes deep into us. And whether life feels right now like the mountaintop or the bottom of the valley, help us remember that in you, because of what Jesus has done, we are deeply rooted trees. Thank you for this new life in Jesus. Amen.